Amen. You know, on Saturday mornings right now, uh, we're uh, reading in 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel, Saul right now is chasing David all over Israel, trying to kill him. And, uh, and David has no malice towards Saul at all. And as you listen to that song and you realize that Mephibosheth is the child of a man who unreasonably hated David and wanted to kill him, and yet David is showing great kindness and love to this family. There's such a tremendous picture of you and I living so selfishly, doing what we wanted to do, and shaking our fist at God, and him saying, come and eat at my table forever. You know, I like the way the song ends, um, leaving Lodabar never to return. You know, come and live with me and I will take care of everything. I've already made all the preparations. I've done everything that needs to be done. You've not earned it. You can't earn it. But I love you. And what's interesting is if you, if you understand the passage, if you understand the context of what the song is singing in the Bible, um, he wants to do this. David wants to do this. He wants, he, need, he wants to find someone who will receive this invitation, someone he can show this kindness to. And, and our Lord Jesus has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He has come to show this kindness and to call out. I'm going to ask you to open your Bible uh, with me, if you would, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. For the sake of time... I'm not going to give any real introduction this morning. You can go listen to last week's message if you want to, or the week before that. We're, we've been in 1 Peter chapter 2 now for a few weeks, um, but I need to uh, get right into the message because I want to go look at another couple of passages that I believe will help us to understand this. But in order to understand what it is we're looking at, let's read 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'm going to read in verse 1 all the way to verse uh, 12. And you can follow along as I read aloud. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, an holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion, chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which, are, which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, 
being disobedient whereunto they were appointed. But ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now a people, now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, that, ye may, that they may be, uh, that they, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Father, help, help now as we look into your word. I thank you for the truth that's in this passage and the truth that's contained in your word concerning the fact that our Lord Jesus is indeed a precious cornerstone to those of us that love him. But to those that would reject him, he is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Help us, Father, as we see these things. Lord, please, please, for Jesus' sake, may there be nobody in this room that would reject the goodness of the Lord Jesus. Lord, may they not have religious effort. May they have the salvation that comes through the blood of Christ. Thank you, Father, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you go back to verse 1 for just a moment, here's what it says. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies, all evil speaking, so there are things that should not be in the life of those who are Christians. There are things that should not be true about the church. This is what he's saying. Now, in just a couple of verses, he talks about living stones, lively stones. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ is this lively stone. He is, it, listen, we're not here. We are in a building. We are here in this building. And this building was built purposefully to assemble to worship Jesus because he's the Christ. But this building is not the church. We could be meeting in an empty field. We could be sitting in folding chairs. And if we were doing that, if the same group of people that, were, that are here now were there, the church would be there. The church are those who are assembled together because Jesus is the Christ. Now this morning, there are those that are assembled here who are what we call members of Tidewater Baptist Church. And there are those who are visitors here at Tidewater Baptist Church. There are some who say that they are members of the church who are not born again, probably. I hope that's, that's not true, but it is probably true. There are an awful lot of people. And there are those who are visitors who may be looking into who Jesus is. They may be new to the area. They may be looking for a good church to go to where they can grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And if that's true for you, I hope that we can be that church for you. And if we can't be that church for you, I hope you find that church. I hope you are able to find a place where you can grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when it all comes down to it, Jesus is the only thing that matters. Really, Jesus is the only thing that matters. I, I say this, it's, it's amazing. Um, the other day I was talking to someone about, and one of the questions that people ask you when they find out you're in the ministry is, what did you do or did you do anything before you were in the ministry? And when they find out what I did before I was in the ministry, the next question is often, well, why did you leave that to go into the ministry? And the answer is, because God called me to leave that and go into the ministry. But let me say, hear me, please hear me. I felt this strongly, as strong as I feel right now, standing here as a pastor, I felt this strongly about how great Jesus was long before I went into the ministry. Do you understand? I'm not telling you that Jesus is everything because it's my job to do so. I'm telling you Jesus is everything because Jesus is everything. Nothing else really matters. And I promise you, on the day that you stand before God, wherever you stand, on the day that you stand before God, the only thing that's going to matter on that day and from every point forward is what did you do with Jesus, who is the Christ? That's what's going to matter. 
Now, what this passage is saying, and this is really important. Hear me before we go look into Acts. It is wrong that we should cause people to stumble. Do you understand what I mean when I say that? You and I cannot misbehave ourselves. We cannot be selfish. We cannot be petty. We, well, let's just look at it. No malice, no guile, no hypocrisy, no envy, no evil speaking. This can't be true of us. Because if it is, then people who would come to take a look at Jesus would see those of us who profess to be followers of Jesus and say, well, that's not what I want. So we must put aside these things and let the word of God, right, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, what? That ye may grow thereby. How do I grow in grace? How do I grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus? And the answer is by the word of God. Amen? Just open the word of God. You know, I, I spend a, a, a good amount of time, a fair amount of time uh, uh, in counsel. The other day I was counseling someone, and, and this is what they said, and I believe this to be true completely. They said, when I read, I don't get very much out of when I read the Bible. And I said, yeah, I know. I felt that way too. I remember before I was saved, I got very little out of the Bible. And I said, so let do this instead. Instead of focusing on what you don't understand, just find out what is clear. Just, find, just read and say, what's clear to me here? What's clear to me? I said, but ask God this. Please show me what's true about Jesus. Just show me what's true about Jesus. Because, and, and I will tell you, the difference between reading the Bible as a book and reading a Bible as a letter from God who wants you to know his son really changes everything. If you'll have the humility, the humility necessary to say to God, please show me the Lord Jesus. Listen, not the doctrine of the church that I'm thinking about attending or that I do attend. Not what are my pastor's favorite points are. Just show me the truth about Jesus. This will change everything. Because, and listen, I say this confidently because it is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come unto a knowledge of the truth. And praise God, the word of God is the truth. So just do that. We, you and I, those of us that are born again, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about it. <clears throat> this morning at uh, nine o'clock, a, a group of men met in uh, what we call the old teen hut, which someday we'll call something else. <laughs> or maybe not. And there was a small group of us. And we met in there to pray. And we, on, and I said this, when we were sitting there, we could, we could it's, it's, it's almost noon. So we could, if we just, just stayed in that room, we could be in that room for three hours. We'd be in that room for three hours right now. And I think there were just four men in the room this morning. But those four men could have sat in that room and prayed and read the Bible together for the three hours that would have passed and had a, honestly, a wonderful time doing it. Yesterday morning at Saturday, Saturday at 8 o'clock, we met here. We meet every Saturday. You're welcome to join us. Every Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, we meet in the, what's called the large classroom. And we meet in there and we open the Word of God. We read the next chapter, whatever the next chapter is. We've been doing it for many, many years. We've read through the Bible a great deal. It's a tremendous blessing. Anyway, and that's, where, that's why we're our first Samuel right now. And so I want to say there were, I don't know how many, let's say eight. Eight, eight men there yesterday morning. And it takes about two hours, every, every Saturday morning, two hours. Now listen, this is, I, there's a reason for this. In those two hours, we read a chapter, we go through the chapter together. Everybody in the room just shares whatever the Lord has laid upon their heart. Similar to what we do on Thursday night, we read a chapter on Thursday night. We let the Word of God speak. We just let the Word of God speak. We share together what God has shown us through the Word of God, and then we pray together. And we pray specifically for the needs of those that we know. Now, what I mean by, well, the reason I bring that up is this. This is a different <coughs> setting, right? You all came here this morning expecting to sit someplace like you are right now and have people standing up here doing various things. And that's important and wonderful. But I, I mean this with all of my heart. I would far, I personally would far rather split into groups of about eight and I could take time and be in, uh, with seven of you at a time and we could sit and talk about how great Jesus is. Yeah, because I don't, I no longer, I don't want to just preach sermons. 
I want you to understand how important this book is. I want you to realize how great Jesus is. And so the purpose of the, of the message, the purpose, purpose of the preaching is not for religious conversation, if you understand what I'm saying. It's that you would see what the passage says. So here's what God says to you and I. Let's just, you know, let's just take a small group of us. We just take, you know, we, if I take the, the four of us right here, right? Just Jeff and his mom and, 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 and Betty, just the four of us. And we say this, let's agree together that we're not going to hurt each other with our words. Let's agree together that we won't be selfish, that there'll be no malice, that there'll be no hypocrisy. Let's agree together because I think we could be a help to other people. And I really believe, honestly, the, th the people I just said would say, yeah, I want to be involved in that. I really want to be involved with that. So let me ask you this. Let's break this up into small groups again. And you just pick a few people around you and say, let's agree that this is what we're going to live like. Now, by the way, if you're not a new creature, if you haven't tasted and seen that the Lord is good, you can't really do this. You don't have the power in your flesh to do. Even though, by the way, there's nobody in the room that would say, let's try to help people. Everyone in the room would agree. Let's try to help. Nobody would disagree with that. But the power to do that is not in the natural man. That's why we see people behaving like they're behaving on campuses, college campuses all over America right now. That's why we see people behaving like this. Many of them feel strongly about what is, quote unquote, right and what is wrong. Whether they're right about what's right and what is wrong, whether they're right about it is, an, is arguable. And obviously it's arguable because that's all everybody's doing. But if we could simply agree to this, let's just, let's see, what's it say? Let's lay aside all malice. Anybody want to sign up for that honestly? How many of you can say honestly, I am a new creature and I really want to stop hurting people with my own selfish malice? Anybody want to raise their hand for that? It's a pretty good group of people. And laying aside all guile, I'm <laughs> that's a tough one. All of it now, right? I'm telling you, there is such a thing as convenient guile, right? Right? Yes? Yes? I mean, you, your wife says, honey, what do you think of this dress? Right? And you say... Preacher said, all guile. You know what I'm saying? And then they say, yeah, that's not the dress, honey. You know what I'm saying? Don't do that. That's, just say, I, I love that dress on you, honey. That's a good answer right there. You understand? We, listen, we lie conveniently, and God says, don't lie conveniently. Don't, don't. Be honest with one another. No guile, no deception. Help one another. This is, this is so important. These things that God, now listen, this being true, this being true, what he says then is this. Let's go down. So now in verse 5, those of us that agree that this is true, we've tasted and seen the Lord is gracious. We're letting the word of God change our lives. We've come to the Lord Jesus Christ himself as the living stone, verse 4. So now we can come together as lively stones built up into a spiritual house. In other words, not the physical building, but those of us here, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. This means Means no more, no more Levitical priesthood, no more shedding of animal blood. All of that was just a picture of the blood of Christ. Amen. So let's offer up acceptable sacrifices. Let's come boldly to the throne of grace because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's do it together and let God be honored in our lives. Amen. Yes. So for two weeks, the first we looked at the woman at the well, right? This woman at the well whose life was full of terrible, terrible things. Terribly tragic things. She was an outcast of the outcast. And then Jesus met her and she said, this is exactly what I want. I am willing for you to be honest about me. I am willing to be honest about me. And I would like you to set me free. Amen. That's what we saw. And then last week we saw the rich young ruler. And what, it, what, was, what was the truth about the rich young ruler? And here's what it was. He was not willing for Jesus to be honest about him. He was not willing to let Jesus rescue him from his stuff. He wanted to be who he wanted to be, and he wanted to have what he wanted to have, and that mattered more than letting Jesus rescue him. Yes? And Jesus became a stone of stumbling to this young man. The very one who could have been the cornerstone of his salvation, just like Jesus was the cornerstone of the woman at the well's salvation, but he would not let him. Now, what I want to do this morning is look at two passages, and we need to do it quickly because we don't have a lot of time. So turn to Acts with me. Acts chapter 2 to begin with. John read one of the passages. Now, I'm going to read, you keep turning, you turn to, you turn to uh, Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. And I just want you to notice this. 
Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. But of them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. So unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. Now, what I want you to notice is the response to the preaching of the word by two different groups of people. John read this passage. Go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. There's a great deal more. If you want to see this, um, uh, let's see, where can we find um, Oh, there's so much. We got to go all the way back. We really got to go all the way back to the beginning of Acts chapter 2 when they start preaching. So Peter, verse 14, we start there. But Peter standing up with the 11 lifted up his voice. And so what he's going to do is he's going to start preaching Jesus. And it's just wonderful. If you go to verse 22, it says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you all, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it is not possible that he should be holden of it. Now he's saying this, you killed the Christ. You, the very Messiah that was coming, you killed him and God raised him up. Now, when they heard this, right? So go to verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, notice the response. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Look up here for just a moment. God is looking for the heart response. Do you understand? Not the head response, the heart response. God is God is going to continue to step across your life looking for your heart response when he speaks to you. This is important. This is significant. When they heard this, they were pricked to the heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, right? Men, meaning that they were men that were preaching, and brethren, meaning they were Hebrews, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, circle this, repent. Repent. You must repent. You must repent. If you don't repent, you can't be saved. If you don't acknowledge you're guilty, you can't be forgiven. You must acknowledge that you need to be forgiven. Notice this. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, praise God, because that's us, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Look up here. What would you say about this group of 3,000? And the answer is this. Jesus is precious to them. Yes? They acknowledge their guilt. Now, by the way, this is important. Peter and John and the rest of those that were preaching, they are doing nothing to hinder people from seeing how great Jesus is. Do you understand? They're not standing up in arrogance and saying, we are the ones. Look at us. We are special and great, and you must do what we say. This is what's wrong with the church in America today. The church in America today cannot be heard by the world because the church in America wants to be something on her own. But we are nothing on our own. Do you understand? We are here because Jesus is wonderful. Amen? Yes, no. I mean, honestly, I, I, I know I'm here because Jesus is wonderful. I can't even imagine what my life, I was saved when I was 22. I'm 53. I can't imagine what my life would be. I, can't, I, don't, I honestly don't believe I would probably be alive if Jesus hadn't saved me. And I mean that with all my heart. I doubt I would be alive. If I was alive, I would be miserable. And everybody that knew me would know that I was miserable. But Jesus had made a tremendous change in my life. You understand? So we are assembled together, not as somebody's. And here's the thing I'm telling you, people want to go to a church where they can be proud of the church that they go to. But you, that, that's, it's a contradiction. You can't go to a church that you're proud of going because pride is a terrible thing. 
What you need to do is to go to a church where Jesus is awesome. Where Jesus is who he actually is in that church. Where the people there are being conformed to the image of Christ. And you can invite people and say, you know what? Come to our church. Because you're going to get to hear about how great Jesus actually is. And I promise you, Jesus is great. That's what matters. That's what they're being told. God has made this Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And here's what they said. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. What can we do? What can we do about the wicked things that we've done? And here's the answer. Just repent. Just repent. Just repent and receive the forgiveness that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what they said. Gladly. That's what it says, right? And they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then you can, go, by the way, it goes on and everything is wonderful. Really, it's, it's exactly what you'd want in a church family. Just wonderful. Let's contrast this. Let's contrast this. Turn just a little bit later in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 6. And verse 8. Acts chapter 6 and verse 8. And Stephen. Now Stephen is just a Christian, right? Stephen's a Christian. And Stephen, full of faith and power. Now, by the way, look up here for a minute. This is important. Stephen is not an apostle, okay? Stephen is a Christian. Stephen, listen, this is important that you understand this. We misunderstand where the power is. The power is not in the preacher. The power is in the Christ. You understand? The power is in the Christian because the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the same God lives within the Christian. Amen. So where is the power? And if the answer is this, if you be a new creature, the power is in you. That's where the power is. Not in your flesh. In you that is in your flesh, there dwelleth what? No good thing and it never will be anything good. You are always going to be dreadful. And you know it. And the more you try to do things, the worse it's going to be for you and everybody around you. But if you are a new creature, then the Holy Spirit is in you. And if the Holy Spirit is in you, then the same thing that's true about Stephen can be true about you. Watch this. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue that were of the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and them of Cilicia and of Asia disputing with Stephen. Now look up here for just a moment. As soon as people, this is, this is really true. As soon as people are known for where they're from or about their school of thought, as soon as that's your introduction, you understand? As soon as your introduction is, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm from the school of blah, blah, blah. You're in trouble as soon as that guy starts talking. I'm telling you. This is a problem in American Christianity. I'm of the school of such and such. See my pen? Do you understand? This is a problem. It's a deep, deep problem. This was a problem in Jerusalem. This is a problem in America right now. These people, what they wanted to do, now it says what they wanted to do. They wanted to, do, to dispute with Stephen. They didn't want to receive that Jesus was the Christ. They wanted to prove their point. This is very much like the contrast between the woman at the well who gladly received the Lord Jesus Christ and the rich young ruler who wanted to keep his stuff. These men, I believe they'll come to Jesus as long as they can come to Jesus with their stuff. I have this doctrine. I have this pet thing. I want this thing to be true. And if it's not, I'm not coming. Then don't come. Do you understand? Because the word of God is quick and powerful and the teaching of that school or that school or that denomination or that doctrine over there, it may not be quick and powerful because it may be wrong. Do you understand? What matters is what does the word of God, one of the things that people really wrestle with is when they read this in one passage and they read this in another passage and they say, I'm not sure how those things go together. And the answer is, well, they clearly go together. They're both in the same Bible. But I don't understand. And here's your problem. You're right. You don't. And neither do I. Many things, right? People often say, can you explain to me the Trinity? And I since I can point the Trinity out to you in the Bible. Well, can you explain it to me? No. No. There's a thing called the hypostatic union. Jesus is 100% man and Jesus is 100% God. And people say, and they don't, people don't know the term hypostatic union, but they'll say, can you explain that to me? And the answer is no. 
Can I show it to you? Yes. Can you explain it to me? No. Well, then how do you know it's true? Because God says so. And I, listen, and if you think that's a cop-out, you're wrong. All I'm saying is God's smarter than you are. He's smarter than I am too, right? And I'm, and I'm, I'm okay with that. He ought to be. I hope he is. If he's not, we're all in big trouble. Amen? But they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they subber- the suborned men, which means they got men to, to lie, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So what they did is this. When they couldn't prove that they were right, they got people to lie. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came unto him and caught him and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses which said, this man seeth us not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it it had been the face of an angel. Now look up here. This is really important. There are two things that I don't believe that this this is saying. This is important. One, I don't think this just means he's a really good looking guy. Okay? And two, I don't believe that his face was shining or something like that, like an angel. I believe what this means in the context, I believe what this is saying is it makes it very clear that when they looked at him, they're like, this guy? You're saying this guy is doing terrible things. And I look at him and I don't see a man who's doing terrible things. This is not how he beholds himself. Now, this, the reason that I believe this is critical, and I believe this is critical, is I really believe that a great problem in American Christianity is how people give the gospel to people. Do you understand? Do you understand what I mean? There's not enough peace. There's not enough joy. There's not enough love in the way we're living our lives. Christians want to be selfish and upset, and they still want to insist that everybody needs to listen to them. Well, why would I listen to you? You're selfish and upset. Do you understand? Now, Jesus, I can understand listening to Jesus. Here's a man who's not selfish and upset. But listen, again, if you're a new creature, you don't have to be selfish and upset. You understand? Really, honestly, this is the power of God. I don't have to be selfish and upset. It doesn't have to be about me. Let me tell you about how great the Lord Jesus is. But your life has to line up with that. They have to look at you and say, man, there's a change in your life. There's a wonderful change in your life. And then you can say, yeah, Jesus did this. And then they can say, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> you understand? That's fine, honestly. But they should see a difference in your life first. Don't bother to tell people about the change that Jesus can make in their life if they can't see the change that's been made in your life. You understand? There's a serious, obvious, evident change in Stephen's life and they can see it. They don't like what he's saying, but they can. And he's not saying it mean. He's not saying it arrogantly. He's not arguing and fussing and fighting. He's not trying to be mean spirited. He's simply saying Jesus is who he says he is. And they don't want to hear it. There's so much. We don't have time to go through all of this. Literally all of Acts chapter 7 is is, is about him talking to them. He's going to try. And what's interesting is this. He's, of course, going to use the Old Testament to prove that Jesus is the Christ. Because guess what? The Old Testament proves that Jesus is the Christ. The entire Old Testament shows that Jesus, that the Messiah is coming and the, and the prophecies about the Messiah, because Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled him, it demonstrates that he is that Messiah. Praise God. That's all he wants them to understand. So he's not trying to convince them to agree with him. This is what he's saying. Listen, listen. I'm not arguing with you about this doctrine or that doctrine. I don't even want to talk to you about this doctrine or that doctrine. I just want to tell you that Jesus is the Christ. Let's go to the end of this conversation. I want you to turn with me to uh, verse 48 of chapter 7. Verse 48. They began in verse one by saying, are these things so? And from verse one, from verse two, all the way to verse 48, he's been saying, yes. Now in verse 48, this is what he says. How be it, the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Now here's what happened. What happened before this is Solomon built a great house for God to dwell in. But as Jesus said to the woman at the well, this is just a 
picture of the dwelling place of God. And what God wants us all to be able to do is to worship him in spirit and in truth. And he's going to live within us. Know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God wants to live and dwell within each of us so that we can have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with him and the power of God in us to change us. Amen. So this is what he's saying. That's, that's the context. How be it the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands. As saith the prophet, heaven is my footstool. Excuse me. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? If you want to write this in the margin, 1 Kings 8, 27 and Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. That's the reference to what he's saying. All that he's saying here, he's actually quoting the Old Testament. 1 Kings 8, 27, Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Going on in verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were, what's it say? They were cut to the heart. Was their heart affected? Yes or no? It was affected. Was it affected for good in their own lives? It wasn't. Listen, look up here. And this is why. Because they could not be rebuked. They couldn't. They could not be rebuked. And remember, what, Paul, what Paul, excuse me, Peter had preached was the exact same truth. You guys have killed the Christ. And what did they say? Oh, dear, we've killed the Christ. What can we do? And he said, repent. And the same Christ that you killed will save you. And they gladly received that and said, thank you. We'll be glad to do that. Amen? Yes? Wonderful. So what's going on here? Same exact thing. And it says in verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears. And I have to tell you, you, you read this verse and if this is not what you see, tell me. They cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears. This is what I see. La, 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 la. You know, remember when you were a kid and somebody was talking to you and you didn't want to listen to what they were saying? You cover your ears and you just make a loud noise so you can't hear. Look, they're, they're acting like four-year-olds. Right. It says they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran unto him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. He's going to be important. Right. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. Listen to this. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So how does he die? And the answer is, he died like he lived, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes? They saw him as an angel, someone who would do no one harm. And how did he die as an angel who would do no one harm? As they're killing him, what is he pleading God for? What is he pleading God for? For forgiveness. For who? For them. For them. This is what the church has to be like. This is what we have to be like. And I'm afraid we're about to get our chance in this country. This is what has to happen. You, you cannot make a fist when people are malicious towards you. You can't. You can't. You, you don't need to, by the way. If, listen, I'm telling you, if you're really a new creature, it is well with your soul. No matter what anybody says, no matter what anybody does, if you are a new creature, it is well with your soul. So put away all malice, all guile, all hypocrisy. Put away all speech that would hurt anybody else. And as newborn babes, just keep turning to the Word of God and keep trusting the God of the Word. If you have repented, praise God, you have repented. Help those around you to see the change that God can make so that they can repent. And if they want to reject the change they see in you and get angry because of the change in you, that's fine. That's between them and God, yes? But we wish no ill on anyone. No one. No one. No one. No one. You say, preacher, but what? No one. No one. 
What if they kill us? Fine. Fine. Do you understand? We don't have to. We do not have to. Nay, we cannot. Now let's go back. I'm gonna, I want to I wanna, I wanna go back to uh, 1 Peter. I was going to say we cannot, but I don't have to tell you. I want to show you what it says about us. Go back to 1 Peter chapter, chapter 2. Remember, God is contrasting those to whom Jesus is precious and those to whom Jesus is a rock of offense. But in, 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 he goes on to say right after this, he goes on to say this in verse nine. But ye now listen to me, hear me. But ye are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A peculiar people. That. For this purpose, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Look up here. Look, look up here. Tidewater Baptist Church and churches like her are meant to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people in order that or so that we can show forth the praises of him, the Lord Jesus, who hath called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Amen. Yes. No. Look, look, I'm going to end. I'm going to end in a weird way. I don't normally do this, but I'm going to walk down here. We are here, we are here, we are here together to talk about how great Jesus is. But that's why we're here, to celebrate how great Jesus is. That's, that's why we're here. Do you understand? Do you understand? We do VBS. We go to the jail, the brig, the union mission. We do uh, nursing home ministries. We have a a ministry down at the public school down here. We have all these different things that come out from Tidewater Baptist Church. We have Sunday school classes and and Tuesday night classes and Thursday night men's meetings and Thursday night women's meetings. We have all of these different things. Listen to me, listen. But the whole purpose of all that, the whole purpose of all of that is so we can grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus so that we can show forth how great Jesus is to others. Period. Amen? That's it. That's it. It's the only reason we're here. We happen to be, because, because God has all put us all in one place, and we happen to have people who tithe and give offerings and, and give to missions, we happen to be able to help other people. We happen to be able to give money to help other people who are going through difficult times. And praise God for all of that. But every single bit of it, all of that is because of who Jesus is. All of that. All of that. It has nothing to do, has nothing to do with the bishop, has nothing to do with the deacons, has nothing to do with anything other than who Jesus is and who he's making us. Amen. That's why, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. It is. Now, listen, I'm t- listen, it matters. It really matters. I really believe that churches have turned more people away from Jesus than, than Jesus has turned away from himself. Do you understand what I mean when I say that? I believe that there are people who will not receive that Jesus, the rich young ruler would not receive that Jesus was the Christ. So there are many people who will turn away from Jesus because they do not, they want their stuff. They do not want Jesus, they want their stuff. That's true. But I don't believe that's the problem in America. I believe that the average person doesn't understand the difference between the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the fly-by-night. They don't understand the difference between these things and biblical Christianity. You want to know why? Because they just don't get to see it enough. So let me, honestly, let me ask you this. Are, Are you willing to be done with selfishness, to lay down all the things. Again, if you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, if you've seen that he's gracious, if you know his love, are you willing to stop being selfish you and say, you know what? The people around me need better than that. Honestly, true? Yes or no? Raise your hand. I mean, honestly, if that's really what you want. I really want people to see something better than, what, than me. Yes? No? Anybody? Everybody that want, really means that. Go ahead and raise your hand. 
Now, that's a lot of us. It really, really is a lot of us. Now, some of you might have raised your hand because you saw a lot of other people raising your hand. But I still believe there's an awful lot of people that are here that want this to be true. And praise God for that. Because this is what God wants to accomplish. This is the whole purpose. We are a spiritual church. Do you understand? Do you understand what I It sounds so funny. If I say we are a spiritual church, oh, you're bra bragging. No, no, no. If it's not spiritual, it doesn't matter. Do you understand? It doesn't matter. Whatever we could do in our flesh is of no value. So we must be a spiritual church. Do you understand? We must have, and what I mean by that is we must have the Holy Spirit of God empowering us to be the men and women that we're supposed to be. Yes? All right. Stand with me, if you would. We'll be dismissed in prayer. I could give an invitation and I can ask you to come down and, you know, and, and confirm these things. But instead of doing that, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to go home with these things. You know, some of you are going to go out to eat. Some of you are going to go to each other's houses. Go home and say and read this passage and look at it together and say, you know, let's pray together that God would make us this kind of people. And boy, I tell you, there are so many more people in the Hampton, there are two million people in the Hampton Roads area. There are so many people that we could minister to, but we must have servants in order to minister to them. We must have people who say, I want to be involved deeply, but I want to be involved deeply with the power of God working through me instead of my own strength. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for our time together this morning in your word. Lord, I ask you that you just would truly bless us, that we would all respond by saying, I'll be glad to put away anything so long as I can have Jesus. It's all I want. Thank you, Father, for all of these things. Thank you for your word. Lord, I ask you that you'd rescue everybody here and everybody who's hearing this someplace else. Lord, I ask you that you'd rescue every single one of them from themselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.